Go ahead and open a Bible to Romans chapter 7. We're going to look at a few extra verses that were not printed this evening. Um, we've been going through the Lord's Prayer line by line during the midweek Lenten worship services, and tonight we're looking at the part of the Lord's Prayer where we say, lead us not into temptation. Now, the reason we pray this prayer is not because we're worried about God tempting us or leading us astray. James writes in his letter that God tempts nobody, and Luther's small catechism even says, well, we don't pray it because we're worried that God is going to lead us astray or tempt us, but that he would guard us and protect us as his children in this life, all right? And what we look at here was St. Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter seven. It's this very, very beautiful, but at the same time, uncomfortable chapter, because St. Paul goes in circles over and over and over again, where he keeps talking about this reality of his existence and our existence as human beings, which is, he says, as a Christian, I know the right thing to do, right? Anybody ever known the right thing to do or say? Yeah, right? God's word says you should do this, right? And oftentimes, guess what? God's words and God's commands aren't as complicated as we want them to be, <laughs> right? Because we want them to be complicated so we can wiggle out of them. We're like, well, technically, I'm not doing it. But like, a lot of times, they're very clear, right? Jesus says to serve people. Paul says, treat everybody better than yourself. All right? How's that going for you? Right? Is that enjoyable for anybody? Just walk around treating everybody else. Yeah, you're probably better than me. I don't think most of us do that, right? Jesus says to love your neighbor. And you're like, yeah, okay, I love people, right? Anybody love anybody in the room? Show it. Not a lot of hands. Okay, we're gonna work on loving each other, all right? Pick somebody. It's like, yeah, all right? But he also says what? Love your enemies. That one's not as exciting, is it? Now, here's my point. All those commands do not require me to preach them to you. They don't require me to break down the Greek language for you to understand, right? They're very basic. Serve people, be humble, treat people with kindness, love your neighbor, love your enemy, forgive them, right? And this is what St. Paul's gonna be talking about in Romans chapter seven. He's gonna say, I, I know what God's law says. I know what the word of God tells me to do. I know the right thing to do. And then he's gonna go back and forth throughout the chapter saying, but here's my problem. I don't always do the right thing. Does anybody else have St. Paul's problem? I know what God's word says, it's real clear. And I'm gonna march out that door and not do it. <laughs> I'm gonna, in fact, Paul even talks about Romans 7, I do the exact opposite. And so here's a few of ways that St. Paul writes it. He says in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Right, that's a wonderful description of Christians also being sinners at the same time, right? Anybody ever confused by why you did something? Ever thought to yourself later on when you were more calm, away from the situation and thought, what possessed me to do that? Why would, or here's another one that probably trips more of us up, why would I ever think to say something like that? Like, what is wrong with me, right? And that's what St. Paul's saying. He's like, look, I know what's right, I know what's good, but I don't understand my own actions. He's saying, how can I know what God's word clearly teaches and commands me and calls me to do, and yet I do the very thing I hate? As a pastor and a sinner, I see it this way all the time where we confess the same sins over and over and over again. To the point where we're like, I know I hate that struggle. I know I hate that temptation. I hate that sin. I hate that addiction. And yet, like Paul, we go, I don't understand my problem. I, I, don't, I don't understand what I'm doing. 
Why do I keep doing it over and over and over again? Why do I keep struggling with it? And so when we pray, Lord, lead me not into temptation, we're asking for God to protect us and to lead us out of temptation and out of sin and into life, into his word, into his instruction, into his command. But what I love about Romans chapter seven is God's honesty through St. Paul, where Paul's just like, hey, I know it all. By the way, Paul, he, he really, he's not exaggerating when he says, I know what the law says. He had the whole, what we call Old Testament, memorized, which is pretty impressive. And so he knows it all, and he knows all the commands and all the rules and all the legalities of it, and yet he goes, I, I still don't. Do it. He goes on later on in verse 18. He says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Right? Perhaps that's where some of us often find ourselves, where it's like, hey, I want to live different. Anybody ever said, I want to live differently, or I want to stop doing something and start doing something else instead, right? Anybody ever wanted to get rid of a bad habit and replace it with something better, right? That's what Paul's saying. He's like, hey, uh, this is not great. <laughs> I'm not proud of myself that I know what God wants, but I, I do these confusing actions called sin. And so what he's saying is, here's what I do. I, I desire to live differently. I desire to please God. I desire to follow Jesus. And yet he goes, but for some reason, I, I don't have the ability to carry it out. I don't have the ability to always do it. And then he goes on and he gets even more sad about himself. In verse 9 he says, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want, it was what I keep on doing. Right? And I don't know a better description of what does it mean to be a sinner, right? <laughs> we talk about sin. We talk about how we are sinners in need of God's grace. Well, here's a wonderful definition of what does that actually look like? And Paul says, well, it's, it's desiring to do good, and yet, instead, I do the sinful, evil things that I don't want to do, right? I like that Paul's saying, like, I'm fighting against it. I don't want to do it, and yet, somehow, I still do what? That evil, that sin, I still give in to that temptation. And so Paul is wrestling with this reality that so many of us wrestle with, this, this burden that we carry as people that, that believe in Jesus and are forgiven, we're called saints, and at the same time, we're still what? Well, we're still sinners, right? We're still like Paul. We're like, yeah, I know the good, and I have desire to do it because the Holy Spirit's guiding me, but I, I don't always do it. And when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, lead me not into temptation, we're asking God, I, I don't want to go down that path anymore. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to struggle with those things. I don't want to give in to that evil anymore. So will you please... Rescue me and lead me in a different direction. When we talk about sin in the church, we often use a word called repent. In the Greek, it's metanoia, and it means to change your mind, change the direction of your thinking. So it's literally like I'm going in this way, like Paul says, right? I, I keep doing the evil that I hate, that I don't want to do. And repentance is saying, now I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm gonna think differently, I'm gonna live differently, I'm gonna do things differently. And that's our prayer request when we ask God, our Father, who loves us and cares for us in the Lord's Prayer. I, I don't wanna be led down that road anymore. Right, and I think Paul would agree, right? That's why he's going like multiple verses, he keeps saying the same thing over and over again, like I know the right thing to do, and I just don't do it. I love that he says, I don't even understand my own actions. He's like, there's no reason to it. It's not logical. It doesn't line up with what I know in God's word. And he also says, it also doesn't line up with my desires. And so what we're asking God to do is, would you protect me 
from those temptations? Would you protect me from those habits and those addictions and those struggles? Would you protect me from that evil? And would you guide me into a different way of life? Now, God's word talks about this all over the place. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, God speaks to Moses, and he's commanding the people of Israel near the end of Moses' life, and he says, but the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. So what does God say to his people? I've given you my word, right? I've told you here's what I want from you. Here's my commands to you. And he's saying, and you can understand it, (laughs) right? That's not the problem, right? The the real problem of our struggle like St. Paul's is not, do I understand what God is saying, right? Now, we might wanna hide behind that as our defense, but I don't think God's commands are overly complicated. And so he says, I've given them to you, and you can understand them, you can do them. And then later on in Deuteronomy 30, he says, see, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. And so he's saying, here's these paths. You can follow my word, follow my commands, follow me, and it will lead to what? It will lead to life and goodness. Or there's another path through life. You can ignore God's commands. We can reject them. We can follow our temptations. And God says, well, it will lead to death and evil. And we know from many teachings in the New Testament, that's what sin ultimately leads to in our lives. It leads to death. One of the most famous lines in all the scriptures from St. Paul is the wages of sin is death. So we know that, right? And God even says, it's not that you aren't gonna understand. I've given you my word. And I've told you how to have life. And then again, if you're not familiar with Deuteronomy, perhaps you're familiar with the book of Psalms. Psalm 119 is incredibly famous, and it says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, we've turned that into a wonderful song that many of us are probably familiar with, but before it was a song, it was a reality check of what is going to guide my life? What is gonna give me light and direction in life? And it's, God's word. So like St. Paul is saying in Romans 7, the issue is not that I don't know God's law or that I don't have God's word. The issue that Paul brings up is, well, I'm a knucklehead. (laughs) I know the good that God wants me to do. It's very clear. He's given me his instructions. And yet, what is our problem? What is the struggle of St. Paul and all of us? I keep doing the wrong things. I I, I keep doing the things that I I don't even want to do them. And yet somehow, we wake up one day and we go, why did I do that? Why did I behave that way? Why did I say that? You know, Psalm 119 also says this. My soul longs for your salvation so I hope in your word. And ultimately, this is Paul's conclusion, right? This is our prayer when we ask God, lead me not in temptation. What we're asking him is, you've got to be the one that delivers me. You've got to be the one that rescues me from myself. Because as awesome as you all are, and as smart and as wise and learned as you are, We all end up like St. Paul at some point. We all end up going, I don't even understand my own actions. I don't even understand my own words. Why did I do that? I don't even like this evil thing. I don't even want this sin in my life. I don't want this destruction in my life. And yet, here I am, making a mess of things. And so we need to join the psalmist of 119 when we say, my soul longs for your salvation. And that's what we're doing when we pray, lead me not in temptation. We're saying, I need you to lead me to life. Because what we learn from St. Paul is, if it's left up to me, 
right? This is gonna be a struggle for our pride. But if it's left up to me, guess what? I'm not always going to choose the path that leads to life and goodness like God told me to in Deuteronomy. And if it's left up to me, right, and this is one of my great frustrations as a pastor is when so many people give each other the advice, what does your gut tell you? Listen to your heart. There are lots of Bible verses that are telling you that's a terrible, 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 terrible idea. Right? I don't know if I threw enough terribles to make a point. Right? Old Testament and Jesus himself are both like, don't listen to your heart. You know why? Because Jesus says, guess where all the evil and sinful desires and destruction in your life comes from? Your really, really not wise heart and my really, really not wise heart. So if it was just left up to us of, no, God, I've got it, and I will figure out what to do next, and I will figure out the path of life, we're gonna walk down the wrong road more often than not. And that's why the psalmist cries out, hey, Lord, your, your word is a light to my path and to my feet. You are the guide for me in all things. And he also says, and I'm longing for your salvation because I can't walk the path myself. I can't choose the right path on my own strength and with my own heart, with my own gut. Right? That's why I love Paul says in Romans chapter 7, I don't even understand my own actions. How many of you think St. Paul was really wise? Anybody? Yeah. How many of you think he was a good follower of Jesus, a good example of the faith? I do. And yet, what does he declare? Well, if it was left up to me, I don't even understand my own actions. Right? How many of you want to follow somebody down a path, and they go, by the way, I have no idea where we're going, and I have no idea what I'm doing. How many of you are like, yeah, this will be a good hike? <laughs> no, you'd be like, I'd like a better guide. And so what do we do? Well, we cry out, Lord, I long for your salvation. It's your salvation that I need. Not my own, not my own strength, not my own wrestling through it and fighting through it and getting uh, past this struggle on my own strength. Not me listening to my heart and choosing my own wisdom and my own adventure path. But it's following your word and your salvation. This is what Jesus is telling us. Hey, when you pray, pray like this. Lead me not into temptation. Because God, I, I need to be your sheep and you need to be the shepherd that guides me into the path of life and goodness. And so at the very end, after Paul spirals in this circle over and over and over again saying, I'm not doing it right. I choose the evil over the good. I don't understand my own actions. He says this in verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, my flesh, my body. So what Paul is saying is, I, I know it's God's word. It's in my mind. It's in my spirit. And yet, it's like an out-of-body experience. He's essentially saying, but my body, my members, my heart keeps choosing sin. And then he gets to this wonderful point in verse 24. He says, wretched man that I am. That's a great Bible verse to put on your fridge and your mirror every morning. Just like look at that and be like, oh, here's a good reminder. I'm not as wise or as smart as I am, think I am on my own. A wretched man that I am. And then he asks this question, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I just want you to think about this for a minute. This is the Apostle Paul. How much of Jesus do you and I know because of his life and because of what he wrote and taught us in the scriptures, right? And yet he was still able to say, I don't understand my actions all the time. I don't always choose to do good. I choose evil and my sinfulness over and over and over again. And he's crying out, he says, well, who's gonna rescue me? 
And then he gives, of course, the wonderful answer, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here's what Paul's teaching you. He's saying, I didn't rescue myself. He didn't say, I just finally figured it out and got a little bit wiser and got a little bit smarter. I got a little bit holier and more humble. No, he's saying, here's the only thing that rescued me from myself and my own temptations, my own personal struggles. He says, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And see, this is what we are praying for where we say, lead me not into temptation. We're telling God, I can't do it on my own. I will not choose righteousness and holiness and goodness in life every time. And in fact, if we're humble enough like St. Paul, we will admit, I'm wretched. I choose evil and sinfulness more often than not. And so, Lord, I need you to be my rescuer and deliverer from all temptation and from all sin. We have to join in the psalmist and say, my soul longs for your salvation. And yet, the way Paul phrases this is wonderful. He says, thanks be to God. Why is he already giving thanks? Because he knows, even though I'm wretched, even though I'm struggling and choosing wrong, he's saying, but thanks be to God because I'm still rescued and redeemed and saved by Jesus Christ. He's not saying, oh, well, when I get better and I figure it out, then Jesus will rescue me. Paul's giving thanks for God's salvation in Jesus when he's already messing up, when he is stuck in that struggle of, I don't understand my actions. I don't know why I would say something like that or do something like that. Why do I keep choosing this thing over and over and over again? And that's the beauty of God's grace. It's that in that mess of life, in that struggle, while we are still wretched, while we are still choosing death over life and evil over good, Jesus saves you and redeems you and forgives you. And this is why Paul says, thanks be to God, because it's already true. You are stuck in your sins. You are wretched. And you are loved and redeemed by Jesus. And so you get to be like, yeah, okay, I, I struggle. I choose wrong. But at the end of the prayer, we get to go, but thanks be to God for Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And so when you pray the Lord's Prayer, my encouragement to you is when you get to that line, lead me not into temptation, you would pray with great humility, with the reality in your mind and your heart of, Lord, I need you to be the one leading me to goodness and life, because I can't do it on my own. And when you get to the point like Paul, where you're like, I'm kind of wretched this week, you would also remind yourself of the good news of Jesus Christ for you and say, but thanks be to God because I have Jesus.